All right, so we've got Daniel Vetter here talking, embracing the atomic display age, and I'll hand it straight over to him. Yeah, hi all. Um, I'm Daniel. I, I work at Intel's open source technology group on the graphics driver. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about the new uh, display infrastructure, the, the atomic mode setting. And uh, I'll start a bit with the history of what has all been uh, in, in kind of Linux display support to also kind of explain why all the existing stuff was not cut out for, for the future, what we needed. Uh, and then I'll look a bit into how uh, Atomic solved these problems and why it's a pretty awesome thing for Linux, I think. So long, long ago, way before I kind of started hacking around on this stuff even, oh, the, the Linux display stack was a pretty decent horror show. And first, uh, it, most of the display driver was in user space running, running an X server. And apparently that happened because long, long ago when Linux didn't even exist, uh, you had to shell out a lot of money for getting uh, licenses to write kernel drivers for, uh, for Unix kernels. So everyone just wrote their open source uh, graphics drivers in user space. And when Linux happened and, and the open source x386 uh, happened, uh, people just ported them over. Uh, of course, Linux also had real in-kernel display drivers in the FBDEF subsystem, but uh, FBDEF is just a dumb frame buffer. So if you want to do things like select your outputs or have two outputs or things like that, FBDEF kind of needed hacky extensions that just couldn't do it. And it was combined with, uh, with a totally unsuitable acceleration architecture, which was kind of designed for the blitter engines of the 90s and not really for 3D stuff where you have big chunks of your driver and user space. So hence we had the, the, the DRM, the direct rendering manager. So in short, you had like three different drivers fighting over the same piece of hardware and pretty much tripping over each another all the time. So seven or eight years ago, uh, this got fixed with kernel mode setting, a real kernel driver which has a uh, which does the, the, the memory management and, and uh, execution management stall for, for the 3D workloads, which, which has a real uh, driver for the display side in the kernel so you can manage it with support for multiple outputs, with support for mode setting and, and configuring everything. And a somewhat related thing that also happened uh, around this time was People were kind of fed up with the de desktop tiering all the time because in the old days, if you wanted to watch a video, uh, your CPU was massively overloaded with that, so you needed to use this video overlay piece of hardware to do the video upscaling and, 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 and color co space conversion. And now if you moved your window, maybe the cursor was already moved and the X server kind of redraw half of your frame of, of your window frame and, and, and the overlay plane was somewhere else, so it was all a total mess and disaster. So to fix that, uh, essentially Linux switched over to uh, uh, arranging, uh, compositing the desktop with GL because then you just render everything into one. GPUs have become a lot faster, uh, so you could even render video, shocking. And, <laughs> And, and since GL has actually the concept of uh, updating frames uh, synchronized to the V blank, it didn't tear anymore. So it was really awesome on the desktop. Uh, well, there was, there was one problem, or just kind of the first problem where, where kernel mode setting uh, falls short. And that's if you have lots of displays, hardware engineers are kind of cheap fellows. So they, 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 they don't give you, they, maybe they give you three outputs, but they don't give you three clock generators because they're expensive or whatever. So as long as two of your outputs use uh, 
uh, use the same clock, the same mode, you're fine because then you can use one clock to drive two outputs. But if you need three clocks, then, then, then it doesn't work. So uh, if you wanted to switch your configuration, like users, uh, switching between users that had different resolutions, uh, both setups kind of worked. But in between, it could be that one server kind of switched the first display, and now suddenly needed three clocks, and it didn't work, and the thing fell over and crashed, and everyone is unhappy. Uh, so that's kind of the first thing they where the kernel mode setting API was falling short. And the reason it was falling short is that updates were all done individually, like enable this display, disable this display, and not all in one go. So you could end up with, with kind of invalid state in between. Now, you, you can work around this by just always disabling everything and then enabling everything in order so that it's well defined, but it's kind of unpretty. Uh, as, yeah. I mean, it means lots of, of flickering and stuff. So that was kind of the first thing we, uh, we needed. We wanted to update the entire display state. On the other hand, like who has three displays, it's a bit of a niche market, and that kind of explains why it was kind of good enough for eight years. Uh, the real problem is um, these video overlays. I mean, we got rid of them on the Linux desktop because they look ugly. But they're actually useful. And if you, if you look at it, a YU Wii plane is, is not just different color space. It actually has less information per pixel. So it, it, it uses a lot less. It uses only half the storage per pixel compared to an RGB. And let's, let's say you have a 1080p video stream. That's, if I've done my math correctly, about 4 megabytes per frame. And then you want to display this on a, on a 4K tablet or whatever. And, and that's over 30 megabytes per frame, because lots higher resolution, more, more data per pixel. So if you think, OK, you need to read out the YUV frame in your compositor in the GL step, then you need to upscale it and color transform it, and then you need to write it again. So you need to, to write over 30 megabytes. And then your display controller needs to, again, read this. So if you add that up and, and multiply it with the 60 FPS, you realize that uh, this kind of reading everything once and writing it again to do your GL compositing step, I'll blow through two gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Now, your phone has about six gigabytes of memory bandwidth, <laughs> which means there's not enough memory bandwidth anymore to uh, draw a full screen. So that kind of doesn't work. And, and there's other examples, like if you have a split screen and want to merge them together, or just <coughs> multiple apps. And, and so the reason why overlays have the comeback or kind of always exist that there's a bad mobile, because you just can't draw your entire screen if you do a, a GL compositing step in between. And, and the other thing is also, draw, using that much memory bandwidth keeps your, your, your chip alive. It, it sucks down power. Whereas if you just read these four megabytes per frame, like 60 times per second, it's much less. And you lose, use, use much less power. But the problem, again, was with the old X days, if you moved something, the cursor moved, your overlay moved, the, the other stuff was, it was not synchronized. It was not done in one step atomically. And so uh, that, that's the real reason, really, why atomic needed to happen because we need to use hardware planes on mobile, on SOCs, because there's just no other way to, to get the pixels on the screen without uh, using too much power. And it needed to look pretty. So yeah, essentially Atomic, the real reason why we needed to do Atomic updates all in one go, not apply this individual bits and pieces, was yeah for mobile to avoid tearing. Um, yeah, maybe the, the question is also, why, why, was, why wasn't KMS kind of atomic? And that's, that's kind of just an accident of history, because the X server just is front of a drawing, so it just draws as soon as it gets a command from clients. And so it, it doesn't have a concept of now everything is complete, 
now you can draw your frame, can update your cursor position, uh, update the video uh, overlay. So, so that's kind of why uh, KM is, was not this atomic thing. Now, obviously kind of SOCs and tablets exist since more than one year. So Google had a pretty big problem because every one of their hardware vendors kind of started out with a horrible FB dev driver and smashed their own atomic thing on top with custom hacks and no consistency, but a lot of bugs. So uh, what, what Google, Google folks have done about three years ago, they, they created a, an atomic display framework for themselves just to fix their problems. Uh, but that was very specific for Android and had, 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 a, had a bunch of pretty serious shortcomings. One of them is uh, ADF has only one update queue. So we have two displays and they're never going to run at the same frequency. Uh, oh, not exactly. Then you can update them independently. So you essentially had to run like the faster screen at the uh, refresh rate of the slower one. Which, which means you have like this, I think it's called shutter. Uh, yeah, shutter when it kind of doesn't smoothly update your frames. That was kind of not good, especially if, we, if we're looking at the Linux desktops where uh, multiple screen is a pretty common thing. So it, it's, it did support multiple outputs, but you couldn't really draw independently. And I mean, the reason for that is that Surface Flinger, the Android compositor, is designed for a tablet. You're not going to have like two screens. So then still today, they don't have more than one update queue. Oh, uh, ADF also kept around a bunch of, of the old mistakes that we've started to regret, like, like DPMS. DPMS is, is the display power management standard. And way back when there was kind of still big a uh, huge uh, uh, cathode ray tube displays. It kind of made sense to have uh, more than uh, on off uh, for, for power management because these things had big, huge magnets and stuff that you needed to uh, uh, power up. And so there were like four levels or so. Uh, but yeah, an LCD is either on or off. So that, that is a lot of complexity and drivers for no use because no hardware supports it at all. And they also resurrected old, old mistakes like uh, the mid-layer uh, mistakes. And uh, I'll explain this shortly. This, this pretty common label for a design mistake in, in the kernel. And essentially, is, uh, the, the insight is you can never predict how fancy hardware engineers are going to be with the next iteration. So if, if you try to have like an interface and then think, okay, for most drivers, it would be nice to keep an asynchronous update queue for them. Or for most drivers, they're split into uh, a pipeline and, and encoders and transcoders. So let's build that into the framework. There's always going to be some piece of hardware that it totally doesn't fit. And then you have a problem because you have this huge stack in between that sits between the user space requests and what your driver wants to do that mangles the request somehow. And, and you need, in the driver, you need to undo that. So in, in, the, in the kernel mode setting, uh, what we've done is we pretty much directly pass the entire request to, uh, uh, to the driver. And the driver then implements uh, the mode set sequence using a, a, a set of helpers. So if it doesn't fit, you can just write your own or just pick pieces. And ADF was not done like that. It, it, especially it was doing the buffer management for drivers. So if you have your own buffer manager, you were pretty much screwed. So that's kind of ADF was not ready for upstream. Uh, there, there were kind of more problems with it. One is it, it was not extensible. Uh, the entire uh, display update was just an unstructured blob. So your user space had to know exactly what your kernel driver was doing, and most of them just sent in a, a pile of register values without much or any checking at all. Uh, it was also not really atomic, 
It was only atomic for plane updates, like if you moved your cursors and overlays and stuff around. And if you wanted to change output, it was again step by step. And that was kind of a problem we had on, on the desktop. So uh, didn't, didn't, didn't fix that problem. Uh, it was also completely new a subsystem, so needed new drivers and needed new user space. And so it um, wasn't, wasn't really something we could, could pick up for upstream. Now, one, one thing that needed to happen first in upstream is, is fix up a bit of the semantics of, of kernel mode setting because since, since this entire thing was kind of grown uh, uh, on, on the back of X, uh, it, it used a, a X set of the concept. So you, you had one primary plane for your entire display, which was essentially for the desktop, and then maybe some video overlays on top, and then a, a cursor. But if you look at hardware, and especially if you, uh, if you look at SOC of uh, mobile chips, they don't have a distinction. They just have a big pile of planes that you can use for whatever. So you can use a plane for a video window in like your browser or on the next frame. You can use it for the status bar if that thing uh, kind of has something special or for a uh, UI overlay or for your game. And so the first thing we needed to fix uh, to kind of prepare uh, the, the kernel mode setting subsystem and DRM for, for the future is uh, switch all these special cases of hardware planes to display stuff on, on, on the screen and, and merge them together into one concept of universal planes. And uh, we've done that about two years ago. And uh, with, with that, uh, uh, we kind of set the stage for at least the object structure was saying we had just uh, the, these plane objects to scan out uh, uh, data from from the memory. Then one kind of abstract uh, display pipeline object which you can use to uh, compose your, your desktop or your screen from all the different elements, and and then uh, the outputs that you could configure. But of course, it it was still not atomic. It was all bits and pieces and tearing and horrible. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's look a bit about what the upstream atomic ABR looks like because obviously the, the approach from, from ADF where you just pass a blob to your driver uh, doesn't work. So, does it switch? Where's my cursor? <laughs> it's behind you. <laughs> oh, well, the keyboard still works. Um, so the first thing we needed is we needed to allow partial updates because we didn't want to rewrite all the drivers. And we didn't want to rewrite all the user space. So the old user space should still be able to work on, on new atomic drivers. And old user space always said, change this bit, move the cursor a bit, move the, move the video overlay, uh, overlay a bit. OK, now it's sh now show the new da desktop. So we, we needed to be able to do uh, non-atomic or partial updates using the atomic interface. So. That, that's kind of the, the first thing. And of course, a, a, an opaque blob was out of the question. So what we ended up using is uh, just generic properties. Well, like I said, we, ha we have a bunch of objects like planes and the display pipeline and outputs. And then we just attach properties to them. For example, this output is connected to this display plane or this, uh, oh, uh, display pipeline, I meant. Or this display plane is attached to this uh, display pipeline, so you have them all connected, and it's scanning out this bit of memory, and it's positioned at wherever you want to have it, like if, if it's a cursor or, or just a, a video box. Uh, and so we use properties, essentially object, property, 
type and property value as the generic transport. And obviously that, that's easily extensible. You can just shovel more uh, uh, properties in your array from, from uh, user space to the kernel. You can do partial updates easily. You just specify only the properties you want to change and say everything else should uh, stay the same. And uh, so, so that kind of property transport was uh, the, suited all, all the, the requirements. And uh, properties themselves were either simple values like x or y coordinates for your cursor, or, or some enumerations like what kind of blending you wanted, or whether it should be transparent, or, or whatever. Or it, a property could point to another object to kind of link things up in your display graph. Like I said, the plane uh, connects to a display pipeline, and the display pipeline connects to an output. Or uh, what we also added is, is blob properties, because for some, for some values, it kind of doesn't make sense to specify them in detail, and it's just a big array. Of the, Perfect example is uh, uh, the gamma table for, for color correction. That's just a, a huge array, so it, it doesn't make sense to have like uh, 512 properties for all the entries, especially since um, on hardware you can have anything between 64 entries to 1,024. <coughs> So it, it makes much more sense to just have a blob with a size and say, okay, this is my gamma table that I want to have. So yeah, that's, that's essentially the, the, the transport. Uh, there's some, some details in, in the ABI between user space and the kernel. And uh, one was uh, the X server really love to update the cursor position all the time. Apparently, depending upon which desktop environment you use to boot up, you get like a thousand cursor updates before you, the login manager shows up. And, and obviously, if, if uh, the, this kind of worked because the old cursor interface from KMS was ex explicitly non synchronized. So it just updated a bunch of registers and, and that's it. And tiering and everything was okay because that's what the, the old uh, user space drivers did too. But if you kind of remap the cursor uh, uh, IOCTL calls to Atomic, that meant every time you did a cursor update, you did a full, well synchronized, non tiering update. Really pretty, but every one of them takes a frame and you only have 60 a second, so your thousand cursor updates take a while. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, ha we had to add an hack, a, a hack to the, the legacy cursor IOCTLs to kind of piece X and, and keep that thing broken as it was before. <laughs> but, but still, uh, for most drivers, there, there's some that trip over that, which uh, there's some SOCs which have very strict IO MMUs, and they're not unhappy. Uh, well, they are un yeah, they're unhappy. Yeah, double negation, sorry. They're unhappy when they try to scan out the cursor that's no longer there in the IO MMU window. And so on these, we need to at least make the cursor changes synchronized again, uh, because uh, yeah, otherwise it just wouldn't work. But it's still, for most drivers, uh, they, they don't really notice that uh, oh, we need to cheat a bit there. Uh, the other thing was, I mean, even if you have a generic transport, like with properties, uh, who's going to tell you what values to put in there and what works? There's, there's all kinds of totally, uh, yeah, special uh, constraints. Like uh, you have three outputs with only two display clock generators. Or maybe you have like eight planes, but only four of them can upscale if they're having a good day. And if you hit some random constraint, you, you, you can't use them for upscaling. So the big question was, how are we going to expose this to user space? And one thing, and that would have been pretty futile, is just try to describe the hardware. 
But that's, that's not ge really generic because every hardware is, is, is different. It's, it would have been similar to the mid-layer mistake. You can never anticipate what hardware people would come up with next year. And so we needed a, a different way to kind of expose our to user space what's possible. Now, one way is you just have hardware-specific uh, specific, specific knowledge in your user space, which is kind of the Android approach, which has a a hardware-specific driver in user space, or you can do that in, in X2 with the Intel or AMD or whatever drivers. But we still wanted to kind of have something that just works in a generic way. And the way we've done this is with a test-only flag. So you can give the kernel your entire update and say, but this work? And the kernel can say yes or no. And, and so you start out with your, your base plane, with your desktop, and say, would this work? If the kernel says, no, you, you have a bit of a problem, then you probably need to shut down a bunch of displays. But I mean, we can assume that at the beginning, this, the displays are on, and you can at least uh, draw a full screen desktop. And then you can say, OK, maybe I want to use this, this video. I want to display this in an overlay plane, because it would be more efficient. So you do a second request with the overlay plane, uh, uh, it added to your properties, what's going on? <coughs> and ask the kernel again. And then maybe you have a status bar that, or, or subtitles that you don't want to render, but just use the hardware to, to blend together. So you, in a second step, you ask the kernel, would it also work with three planes until you eventually hit into a limit, or you can draw everything perfectly fine and in the most power efficient way. And, and that's kind of with this test only mode, which doesn't commit anything to hardware state. Uh, generic user space can figure out what a specific piece of hardware can do. And so, so that's, that's the, the solution there. It's also pretty easy to implement in user space because uh, it's just a, an array of properties that you send to the kernel. So you just add more. And when the kernel says, sorry, this doesn't work, you can roll back to any previous step and just use that. Uh, the other problem was, uh, we always said like we want atomic updates, but the desktop use case where you want to switch out per configuration, and the kind of the mobile use case where you want to use lots of planes are a bit different because sometimes when you need a new plane configuration, you need to shut down the display pipeline and, for example, reconfigure the caches because one plane suddenly needs a lot more cache lines because your scaler needs more cache lines or whatever. And you kind of don't want to, your screen to constantly go off and on and off and on when you're watching videos. So there was a clear difference between a mode set change and, and just a, a, an update of the compositing state of, of, of your desktop or mobile screen. So we added a, a, an allow mode set flag for that. And that's kind of the, the public interface between uh, the kernel and, and user space. But the internal interface between uh, two drivers is, is a bit different because it would be fairly cumbersome to, to always deal with uh, arrays of abstract properties. Uh, we still want to keep the FPDEF emulation that we had in the old kernel mode setting around. And kind of writing uh, FBDEF emulation on top of, of, of arrays of properties, that's, that's not pretty. So internally, the properties get decoded in the core and, and put into structures. And we actually uh, do that even for extensions. So stuff that's kind of new, like rotation, which wasn't in the, in the bare kernel mode setting uh, feature set. We also decode that into properties so that drivers just don't have to deal with that. That makes it also a lot more nicer to, to write the, the compact code between legacy kernel mode setting and new atomic. Because again, you don't have to deal in, in, in properties. Then, now you have these state structures where all the properties are decoded as rotation or with pointers for objects or whatever. Uh, but for partial updates, uh, the way it works is we, we duplicate at the existing state, and then we apply the updates. And uh, 
Obviously, we still want to allow uh, driver-specific extensions for whatever. So all, all these all these uh, structures can be subclassed, and there's function to get and set uh, driver-specific properties that the core can't handle. And uh, finally, the 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 test-only flag is implemented by uh, splitting the atomic commit step into a check and commit. Uh, in two different hooks. So at the end, uh, once the core has uh, duplicated all the state it needs, updated what it needs to change for partial updates, legacy, whatever, or what, what user space asked for, uh, it first always calls the check hook. And in there, drivers can uh, compute uh, derived stake, like how much cash uh, a plane needs, the, the FIFO watermark settings, the the clock assignments, if, if you have shared clocks, and, and all these kind of uh, derived shared resources that hang around in a display core. And then it optionally calls the commit step. If user space set, said, yes, please push, push this to hallway, or it just supplies back the answer to user space whether this would have worked or not. Now, Another bit is uh, is uh, concurrent updates. Uh, like I said, ADF had just one update queue. So what uh, kernel uh, Atomic does, it has state structures per object and a lock per object. Now you would say, doesn't this deadlock because user space can tell you which objects to update in which order, and uh, that's. That's kind of solved with uh, uh, the magic weight round locking scheme that was merged about two, three years ago to the kernel. And essentially, it just deterministically figures out who needs to back off and start over so that deadlocks don't happen and aren't handled unfair. Um, again, we, we didn't have a mid layer. Uh, so, uh, Atomic had a completely new helper library compared to the old one. It was, it was a lot more modular. Uh, it, it improved a lot the state transitions. For example, the old ones, the old helper library liked to call disable function when something was disabled already, which confuses hardware and drivers. And the Atomic library uh, tracks uh, the current state of the hardware much more precisely and so can guarantee that it's never going to call you redundantly, which massively simpl uh, simplifies code. And of course, it, it provides all the implementations for legacy IRCTLs in case you need <laughs> special behaviors for your existing user space, like the cursor hack we had to add. And uh, there's some intermediate helper libraries to give a smooth transition uh, between the legacy old KMS style and new atomic because the driver callbacks that these helper libraries used were not in all cases perfectly suitable for, for atomic. And just in the last few months, we, uh, we implemented suspend resume support with atomic. So it essentially just takes a copy of all your state objects and when you resume, it asks the driver, please apply this. So you, you get suspend resume for free. Uh, we have uh, we've converted the FBDEF formulation to use Atomic, which is just kind of nice for testing. Uh, we've improved the runtime PM support, which is something the, the old legacy helpers were not really good at either. And uh, we added 1,000 lines of documentation for everything. So there's, uh, there's a really nice uh, support for that. Uh, this still a few things missing. Uh, one is it's kind of hard to write generic async support that's both useful and not, not just massively complex. So right now, all the drivers need to, to implement async commit, for, which is used by compositors themselves, but generally just using a work queue. Uh, Android has a different way to synchronize buffer access with explicit fencing, and that's about to happen. Uh, we want uh, support to update the display state faster than uh, the, the, the refresh rate, which is generally useful for like benchmarking and games and uh, 
a VR and stuff like that. And uh, we, we, we're working on a, on a kind of a generic test cases for the atomic interface based on, uh, on the Intel uh, GPU tests. And yeah, there's lots of work on extensions for blending, for better color management. Um, I've added a bunch of links to, to more resources, but I guess that's kind of not interesting. But the big thing really uh, that I want to put at the end is why, why is this so awesome? And if you look back at how kernel mode setting happened, essentially this was implemented by Red Hat and Intel. And AMD kind of happened a year later, and then eventually Novo and a few other drivers. If you look at Atomic Display Framework, who developed the core, the list of people and the list of companies is a lot longer than for KMS a, a few years back. And it's also on the, on the, on the user space side. Original KMS was just for the Linux desktop. Atomic is for Android, for, for Chrome OS, still for the desktop, for anything else. We still have FBDF emulation. So we now have a display driver interface framework that really works for everyone uh, on all Linux platforms. And I'd say the even more awesome part is how many hardware vendors uh, jumped onto this ship in the past year and wrote uh, atomic drivers. Of, of all these drivers here, I mean, that's, if you include the in-flight ones, there's more atomic drivers in one year than in the previous seven years of KMS. And of all these drivers, the only one which is not sponsored by the hardware vendor is, is the MSM1, which is sponsored by, by Red Hat. And Qualcomm is kind of starting to get on board. So I'd say this is, this is one of the most important, if not the most important thing that happened to Linux display support. And I'd say the future is going to be awesome. So thanks a lot. Do you have some time for questions or? Yep. Got a few minutes. You, you're going to run around? Uh, what's the current state of this sort of shipping in releases or not yet or it's, yeah. As far as I know, the Pixel C from Chrome is shipping with Upstream Atomic. As so, that's in like releases, it's not just sort of in dev sort of thing. Oh, it's shipping as in product. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. And and releases. I mean, like not just that product, it's in like all the like current releases of everything. Is sort of what I meant, like generally. Oh, you mean kernel releases? Yeah, like kernel and you know user uh, land everything. I mean, on the desktop side, there's kind of no direct need yet. I think Eric Anhold is working on, on making, adding atomic support to mode setting. But through the legacy stuff, it, it just will keep working. But yeah, it's, I mean, the, the important thing is for mobile, and there it's shipping. Uh, I was just having a conversation the other day with a friend and talking about needing to add a second monitor with maybe a different chip or a different you know, chipset from a different manufacturer. Um, on the desktop, that's, um, you know, and I, I'm sorry, in tablets and that sort of thing, that's never going to be a problem. But um, I, I, although I do wonder sometimes, uh, one of the things that we've seen with you know, people talking about tablets is being able to plug them into your TV, uh, you know, and would it would it need to then turn on a second GPU or oh, you they... know, a second display manager to, to talk to it? Well, how does it? How does this kind of thing work with different it, architectures in the same it, device? It works the same way on on mobile as on desktop. Mobile chips have two, three outputs that you can drive independently, and I don't expect this will ever happen on mobile, but. I mean, on the desktop, we have the prime support that uses in the kernel the DMA buff sharing to kind of connect them. And on mobile, that's actually used to share between the display block and the, the render side of the GPU. So the tooling is definitely there. We, we can support that. But generally, it works like on the desktop. You just have multiple outputs in the same GPU. Anyone else? Questions?
Uh, this may uh, not related to atomic, uh, but uh, I have a question. If you have idea about uh, how to uh, improve the k exact reboot, because for a uh, normal reboot, we get some firmware graphic mode, then switch to KMS, take control of the graphic. Uh, that's highly driver specific. I mean, even with the Intel driver, depending upon which firmware boots, we have different hacks in the driver to kind of recover the state. And in a way, KX is just another firmware. Yes. It leaves the display behind in some not state, and you need to deal with it. Yeah, uh, I just wonder if we have a way to save the early graphic mode. There's, I mean, then you boot in a different kernel, and they don't match the expectations. You, it's driver and hardware specific. You just, it's just work. <laughs> There's no generic magic, I think, that, that helps there, at least in my experience. OK, thank you. Anyone else? All right. I think that is. Cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.